Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We'll be starting in about a minute. We want to make sure that everybody has time to go from one Zoom call to another. But while we're doing that, I'm Brian O'Leary, Executive Director of the Book Industry Study Group, and you probably have been on Zoom enough to know that you have We'd welcome you to that. And if you have questions for any of our participants or for the panel as a whole, uh, please submit them under the Q&A button. Uh, I'll be tracking it throughout the conversation today. And we're, we, we, we've already planned to leave time at the end to make sure that we're able to consider all of your questions. Um, with that in mind, I'd love to introduce our moderator for today, Lindsay McKenzie. She's a technology reporter at Inside Higher Education. Uh, she joined the publication in August 2017, and she's written really extensively about the online uh, program man management market, making her a perfect moderator for today, as well as what it takes for colleges to go big online. She's originally from England, you'll know that in a minute, um, and moved to Washington, D.C. in 2016. Before she joined Inside Higher Ed, uh, Lindsay reported on British and European science policy uh, for research fortnight in London. And her work has appeared in a number of publications, including Science, Nature, and the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Lindsay, thank you for making the time today and thank you for moderating today's discussion. Thank you. Thrilled to be here. Should we get started, Brian? Please, that would be great. Great. So welcome, everyone. This is the uh, Book Industry Study Group panel discussion. Our topic today is the e-learning marketplace beyond the traditional textbook. Uh, as many of you know, the pandemic drastically impacted college instruction last year. It caused many instructors to pivot from face-to-face -to, -face to remote instruction, and that obviously had a big impact on the learning materials that faculty selected. Uh, a recent National Association of College Stores report suggested that the use of traditional print materials by college faculty declined much more quickly in 2020 than in previous years, with more faculty switching to digital courseware and e-textbooks. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. They'll be sharing their insights on what happened in 2020 and their hopes for the future of e-learning. We're joined by Snita Bakshi, Senior Vice President of Wiley Technology and Engineering Careers and co-founder of Zybooks an interactive digital platform for computer science and STEM courses, which was acquired by Wiley in July 2019. We're also joined by Seisha Bolazetti, Senior Vice President of Digital Content at Elsevier's Nursing and Healthcare Education Division. Seisha has a wealth of experience in the industry supporting various e-learning, digital content and ed tech initiatives over the last 17 years at Elsevier and other uh, education publishers. And finally, we're joined by Kent Peterson, who is Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer for McGraw-Hill Higher Education. Kent has been at McGraw-Hill for 26 years and has held leadership positions in many different areas of the company, including finance, product development, sales, and marketing. Uh, so we have a great panel here of lots of experience. Um, please think of some good questions to give them at the end. Um, I'd like to start by asking Snita to uh, cast your mind back to the spring of 2020. And I'd like to know how you and your colleagues um, adapted to the pandemic, what you did to support faculty and students who had to quickly pivot to remote learning. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. Um, you know, I remember that March very well. Um, you know, the specific day when the when we got news of the lockdown and we knew schools were shutting. In fact, we were all at um, our biggest computer science education conference called 6C, which, is, which was in Portland and it was shut down uh, that day right before the floor was supposed to open. We opened up um, the Zybox platform, which is the one that you just referred to that I co-founded. But along with that, uh, Wiley has a couple other uh, courseware platforms. There's new Wiley Plus as well as Alter. And we opened up those platforms for free for anyone, any instructor, any student to use. Uh, and I think um, across these three uh, products, we probably got about 100,000 students across 100, uh, hundreds of universities. But it wasn't just making the courseware available for free, it was also supporting them, supporting the faculty who weren't used to using courseware, weren't used to online education. 
um, in you know pretty sort of dramatic ways. It was all hands on deck for multiple teams. And um, it was webinars, it was the sales team reaching out, the customer support team reaching out to really provide help in any which way. Um, initially, it, uh, there was a lot of, uh, well, how do I use the courseware? But as weeks progressed, it was more around, around uh, engaging students. How do I engage students on Zoom? How do I keep them engaged? There was a lot around academic integrity. We have a number of faculty who work very closely with us. My co-founders is a professor as well. So we did a number of webinars not related to our products, just around effective online teaching. So I think it, um, um, it was also very sort of inspiring time for us and um, the team that I lead, they were really proud to be doing what they were doing, to be able to sort of help in, in this um, time of crisis. I saw really incredible responses from lots of different publishers, especially just around general education and pedagogy and, you know, how do you teach online effectively? There were some really amazing resources created in that time. Um, Ken, I think that you led McGraw-Hill's response to the pandemic, is that right? Yes, and like Smith, that period of March will be forever seared into my memory. Um, you know, specifically, uh, Friday, March 8th, was we learned late in the day that the University of Washington was the first large institution that was closing its campuses. And so over that weekend, we started thinking about how are we going to support instructors that were having to make this uh this transition. And I remember talking with my team saying, well, we'll have to figure out some sort of intake process. So when we come across schools that are closing, how we know how we can help them. And so we started working on that intake process. But then by that following Tuesday, uh, March 10th, uh, the realization came that all of them were going to close. So you don't need an intake process if it's going to happen for everyone. So we moved uh, faster than I've ever seen our company move. Uh, we made a decision like Smith did, did, like Wiley did in one day to open up access to our uh, courseware products. These were the, the products that, that instructors could use to move uh, into online delivery. Um, and uh, that started a whirlwind of three weeks where uh, when the dust settled, we had delivered more than 4,000 courses, uh, which over 90,000 students ended up registering in. And I just think it was a great example of uh, our industry sometimes can be criticized for not moving quickly. I think we proved as an industry that we can move quickly. And uh, Fisher, what was it like at Elsevier in March? Yeah, thank you, Lindsay and uh, Brian. Thank you for having us in the panel discussion on this very important topic. Um, Smita and uh, Kent have touched on this. Um, Elsevier is the world's largest publisher of nursing and uh, healthcare education. And at any given time, you can imagine we have thousands of faculty members and students who are consuming our content across the globe. So during the spring of 2020, when the whole world was grappling with the news of the pandemic and all the uncertainty surrounding it, our teams got to work right away and um, uh, deployed a few initiatives just to kind of highlight, uh, you know, four quick initiatives. Um, again, um, Kent and Smita touched on uh, uh, partnering with the Vital Source and Red Shelf and opening up access to thousands of our eBooks during that time so that the students who left their uh, books behind had to leave the campus quickly. Uh, you know, uh, they, don't, they don't have to kind of, um, you know, be away from the course material. That was probably the, uh, you know, most inspiring initiative, uh, as is Kent said, all the publishing companies come together and roll that out quickly. And on top of that, uh, to help the faculty, how to optimize all the products and tools we have for uh, uh, remote learning and remote teaching, uh, so we put uh, the health education faculty hubs, and we have a number of uh, internal nurse educators and healthcare educators who are the ex-faculty members. So they hosted webinars, they hosted training sessions, they hosted one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions in um, you know, uh, teaching them how to optimize our resources. And we have a testing portfolio uh, within our uh, products called HESI, which is, uh, which is all about uh, preparing students for the nursing and CLEX exam. 
Uh, so we had to quickly partner with a number of remote proctoring providers uh, so that uh, we can, you know, let the schools continue to um, operate the secure testing modality. So uh, we ramped up, you know, 600 to 700 schools within a span of two to three weeks uh, through the remote proctoring. And last but not least, Elsevier is also world's largest uh, healthcare information provider. So we, we have a lot of research information related to COVID-19 and uh, uh, novel coronavirus and infectious diseases. So we launched a uh, Elsevier COVID-19 resource hub, uh, opened up a lot of our material uh, for public access that was uh, used uh, across the globe by both uh, uh, educational uh, professionals and as well as uh, practicing professionals to make use of that. Uh, so those are some of the initiatives that uh, we did from Elsevier point of view. Great, thank you, Tisha. Uh, Kent, I wanted to touch on, um, you said you moved incredibly quickly, quicker than you've ever moved before. Um, and I wanted to ask you what challenges were associated with that, or you know, how difficult was it to develop that faculty support, um, the training materials? What are some of the biggest challenges that you faced uh, professionally because of COVID-19? Yeah, we had to move so quickly, we couldn't even create PowerPoint decks to present our opinions. So, so we had to go back old school. Um, I like to think of what, what McGraw-Hill went through, and, and I believe I'm speaking for the entire industry. It was like a digital stress test in a period of a one month time. You know, We've all been talking about the digital future, and we've been making investments in that regard. But what we saw in, in that short window of time, those first three weeks of March, to me, um, it really stressed our ability as an industry to support an all digital future. So from our perspective, when we made our decision to uh, open up access to our courses, um, we hadn't even thought yet, well, how, how are we going to build these courses? Because we wanted to do it in such a way that they were somewhat customized to where every instructor was at. Uh, then generating access codes at scale was something that we don't typically do. Uh, training, um, that, that personalized training that we typically like to offer to new users of our technology, how do we do that at scale? And then there was a whole group of other customers that we have that were already using our products uh, and we had to help them make the transition from whatever mode they were in to a fully distant mode. And all of them had to happen at the same time. So it was really remarkable to me, the cooperation that we had both within the company and within the industry to make that happen. And, and as Smith has said, the, the, the inspiration, I would say also there was some catharsis for our team members, because as you know, it was an uncertain time in their personal lives. And so the fact that they had to work overtime to help, help the people, the customers, that they're working with, it really helped our folks get through the process also. Tisha, I know you're already doing a lot of stuff digitally. So what was challenging there? What changed last year because of the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, looking back at it, some of the professional uh, challenges, um, you know, both in terms of helping our customers and the institutional partners, but also working with our internal teams, uh, as uh, Kent said, that they themselves are going through lots of challenges in their you know, personal lives and their friends and families. I would say the biggest thing is uh, dealing with the unknown and the uncertainties and planning for various scenarios. We had to have like a plan A, plan B, plan C, you know, just, just not knowing uh, um, how uh, you know, the situation is gonna change uh, and, the, uh, and the lockdowns and some of the campuses were impacted uh, pretty deeply. Also, uh, the whole experience, um, you know, brought a new appreciation to the agile thinking and agile method methodologies uh, to be, you know, flexible uh, with, the, with the planning. And I would say the last but not least is the, at the employee level, keeping our internal teams fully supported, uh, you know, uh, in a 100% work from home, home uh, type of setting and also make sure that they're fully supported in that environment. Uh, that was a big lesson for all the people managers, but uh, but I'm proud of uh, how our teams, uh, you know, help each other during that difficult time and help the customers during that time. 
Peter, I think you only joined Wiley in 2019, is that right? So, so 2020 must have been a huge <laughs> learning curve, really in the deep end there. What was what were some of the challenges you encountered? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'll echo uh, Kent and um, Sesha. Um, I think the most challenging was knowing that our teams were kind of struggling at home, like we all were. Um, children not knowing how schools or moving to online instruction for young for young children or maybe elderly parents at home while as i mentioned it was all hands on deck so <clears throat> there was i remember kind of the frenzy of those days personally myself trying to manage three boys my work my husband's work getting work surfaces in the house for all of us uh, while keeping our teams motivated, our teams were motivated. I want to read out, if you wouldn't mind, uh, a text because I remember it's from March 25th of last year. One of our sales reps who's been with us for a long time, she's been with us for maybe seven years or so, she says, what an exciting time for Zybooks. Um, and then she, you know, she goes on to say, uh, for about for seven days in a row, I've had about five demos a day unheard of except near the beginning of my time at Zybook. So that's kind of the, the silver lining of it. It was very motivating for the team, but the challenges were uh, working really hard, trying to get across, uh, you know, the product scale well, because adding 100,000 students to across three platforms, it's not a huge number, right? It's not a huge percentage. So the product scaled, it was just, everyone had to um, really had, it was all hands on deck. While, while we knew that it was not easy at home for a lot of people and the uncertainty, not knowing. Um, even uh, if you take, you know, skip forward from March to maybe s several months beyond that, the challenges were, where's the industry going to go? Are schools, are enrollments going to decline? Are they going to, you know, increase? What's going to happen in community colleges? So the uncertainty and kind of the scenario planning um, around that. I would say now what I find the challenge after a year of, being in an online environment is um, being creative and, and strategic with and keeping my leadership team motivated. I just want to get in a room with them for one day to be able to talk about how do you develop new things? How do we, right? I think that brainstorming is kind of, that's what I really miss. That's what I find challenging right now. Mm -hmm. We all yeah. miss the whiteboard at this point. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm curious um, how sales were impacted by the pandemic. And Seisha, I was wondering if you could talk about how the sales of digital courseware and e-textbooks were affected versus print textbooks. Absolutely, Lindsay. In the immediate aftermath, um, in the spring of 2020, we saw a significant spike in both the digital textbook and courseware sales. But we also experienced a um, increase in our uh, traditional textbook and print sales via direct e-commerce channels. Uh, again, due to number of campus shutdowns and the bookstore shutdowns, uh, you know, many students, um, you know, came into our websites to uh, be able to get their, um, uh, you know, course materials. Um, and also Elsevier has a globally diverse uh, supply chain and we were able to deliver to our channel partners without any disruption. Now, overall, this is, this is where probably Elsevier, because of the niche uh, uh, specific subject areas we operate in, we might have a little different story compared to some of the Gen Ed uh, publishers. Our traditional textbooks and the print textbooks continue to maintain strong momentum and strength uh, um, while we are seeing rapid expansion in the digital courseware and the digital products. So it is not at the cost of one instead of the other we're seeing growth in, in uh, both sides. Uh, so the traditional textbook um, has performed very well in 2020 and even in 2021, uh, we're seeing a, a very healthy growth in that area also. Really interesting. I wonder if that is specific to health education. <laughs> Sweeta, what did you see? I know that you mentioned you had a lot of new customers to Zybooks. Were they switching from you know a, a print textbook to Zybooks? Um, print or ebook? Typically, yes. So it was sort of not non-use of courseware to moving to a courseware solution. Um, <clears throat> but I think generally across Wiley, what we've seen is that, that you know there has been over the years a decline in print, increase in digital, and increase in courseware. And we probably saw that accelerated somewhat. Um, so I think um, in its last uh, earnings report, Wiley um, 
gave a number of 20% year over year increase in courseware. And I think that's what we've seen, but you know, there has been a decrease in print, but that's higher ed. Um, within trade, Wiley has, if you know the dummy series, right? Wiley owns the dummy series. There was a spike in the dummy series. Um, <clears throat> so, and we also saw in our advanced text, there's as an example within the engineering and computer science portfolio, we have about 7,000 titles in, uh, for researchers and professionals in, um, in advanced text. And I think there was an initial decline, but then there was a spike towards the end of the year. Um, and that was, you know, a lot of that was print as well. So I think generally, yes, print, print is declining, digital and course fair is increasing. And I think the pandemic maybe, you know, changed that, exacerbated that somewhat, yeah. Ken, what did you see uh, last year? And what are you continuing to see now? Well, the, very similar. We did see a significant shift from print to digital. Uh, that was a trend that had been, had been moving that way prior to the pandemic and uh, the pandemic provided a little catalyst for that. Um, but the, the angle I wanna focus on here is just the cooperation between that we had with the channel partners. Uh, Seisha mentioned Red Shelf and Vital Source and how they came to us very early on and said, hey, we, we're hearing stories of students being separated from their course materials. Uh, we'd like to open up our ebook platforms to those students that are without course materials. And again, this is the type of thing we were moving so fast, we really didn't have a chance to talk ourselves out of it. And it turned out to be a, a really great gesture. And so what we saw as we, we started to work through this, uh, you know, a lot of the traditional college bookstores were really in a bad situation because the, with campuses closed, they couldn't have their personnel on campus. And so we had many cases where we worked cooperatively uh, to, to uh, figure out ways that we could get print to students. Um, in some cases, I remember cases where we would ship right to a, a central administration post on a campus where it could be distributed. Um, we did have a lot of increased in, uh, interest in inclusive access, um, but it was just really, again, a great example of how all of the folks in this course material ecosystem came together to make sure students had access to course materials regardless of what, what format it was. I wanted to touch on inclusive access because that's something I've written about quite a bit and does seem to be an increasingly important strategy for publishers um, to sell to an entire class of students. Um, obviously the advantage being that everyone has the materials on day one and um, the billing, et cetera, is kind of taken care of before the students come into class. So. Um, definitely some advantages there. Um, Smita, I'm wondering at Wiley how important inclusive access is and whether you saw any increase in that last year. Yeah, um, you know, within Wiley, inclusive access has had healthy growth and it's an important initiative. And of course, we have a team that's, that's dedicated to inclusive access. Um, I did reach out, um, um, you know, to my team specifically to ask if, what our thoughts were around how much is the pandemic impact? Certainly some, because as you mentioned, bookstores were closed and it's a much more convenient way of getting course materials to students. And <clears throat> there's, a, there's a, um, uh, you know, a price advantage as well for students. So definitely, but it's really hard to say how much it's, it's, been, a, it's been healthy growth in the past, healthy growth now, it's kind of hard to say what if it was pandemic related. I will say for Zybooks specifically, uh, we've had very little inclusive access in the, in the past because um, <clears throat> it's a SaaS product, it's low cost, students typically get it on day one, there's typically close to 100% sell through because the homework is, it's a, it's a big component. So for, for products like Zybooks, we didn't see much of a change, um, but I think generally across Wiley inclusive access is important, has been and continues to be, and it's kind of hard to attribute what of it was specifically pandemic related, but there's good growth in in um, inclusive access. How about at McGraw Hill, Kent? What was your impression of how much inclusive access has grown and how much you would attribute that to the pandemic? Well, as Smith has said, the, the inclusive access had great momentum going into the pandemic. And um, a, a lot of the, I, I think the impact we are still going to be yet to see because uh, inclusive access agreements take time to be put in place. And so at the time, 
of the pandemic in March and April, most institutions had made decisions around inclusive access at the institutional level for the following fall, they had already made that decision. And so we certainly had a lot of last minute interest. And again, this is where the, uh, our, our channel distribution partners did an excellent job over the course of those months to accelerate, in some cases, the setup of those uh, uh, inclusive access agreements that were already in place. And we had a very smooth transition into the fall. What we're seeing this spring is just in con continued interest in this. And part of it's driven by the fact that um, schools really had to rely heavily on their learning management systems during the pandemic for the delivery of course materials. And you know, inclusive access really fits so nicely with using the learning management system as a primary uh, distribution point for course materials. So, um, you know, we, we think IA is uh, one of the best things to happen in our industry in a long time. It's, um, and we like the fact that everybody in the ecosystem can participate in inclusive access. And, um, and if it reduces costs to the students, it's just, it's just all good. And so I think it's gonna continue to see strong growth going forward. How about at Elsevier's Asia? What does inclusive access look like there? Yeah, certainly common themes with uh, what uh, Swita and uh, Kent has said. Uh, we did see a significant growth in the inclusive access sales, but I would attribute this more to our business being in a early phase of that business model. Um, you know, 2020 was, um, I would say, probably the launch point of that inclusive access model. While, you know, standalone products like the standalone textbook and the ebook um, have seen, you know, a lot of growth in that. Uh, but we also have uh, different sales models. Like, you know, one of the models is the total program solutions. It's not just about the course material. It is about some of the value added services you know, that we can provide to the students and personalized teaching and personalized learning and all of that. So that's the other part and uh, the custom packages of the print and digital uh, components and the simulation products, they've also gained a lot more popularity. So I, I definitely think inclusive access is, um, is a very strong, uh, you know, uh, sales uh, approach to help the students and, uh, you know, faculty and the administration but it is among many different approaches that we are seeing success with. I think after the pandemic, um, the numbers of people adopting the free materials and free courseware that uh, you guys all put out was really quite impressive. Um, but I'm curious how many of the faculty and students who switched to a digital product because it was free uh, have stuck with it. Um, and I'm wondering, Ken, if you have any insight into that, how much follow through has there been and um, has, you know, what could be described as quite a risky policy, making lots of materials free paid off? Yeah, well, I, I know initially uh, during the pandemic, there was some concern that the offering of free materials was constituting a kind of a bait and switch type of thing, that there was some, some uh, that, that there may have been in place some sort of agreements that will give you free access for the fall if you use, or free access now if you, you choose to use in the fall. And, and I haven't seen any of that across the industry. Um, but what we did see is we did see a very high retention rate of individuals, instructors that started using digital uh, materials at the time of the pandemic disruption, then going into the fall and now going even into the spring term. Um, so, uh, and, and based upon the feedback we've gotten from customers, the, the, the experience has been a positive one. Um, we hear a number of cases from instructors that were, were reluctant to integrate digital into their courses. Uh, some didn't feel that they needed that, and they've come back now and said they now that they've kind of been forced into it, they've seen some of the advantages that's out there. And then also a change that we've seen among the student population is for a long time, uh, students, many students still preferred print. And over the course of the pandemic, we've seen our survey data show a, a, a flip on that, that uh, more students now actually prefer digital course materials. And the reasons they cite is 
They cite the portability, they cite the searchability. Um, and so that, that makes us think that this digital trend that we've seen happen during the pandemic is going to continue. I sure you mentioned that print sales are still pretty strong. So I'm curious what happened at Elsevier, what you've seen in terms of faculty switching to digital materials or maybe supplementing print textbooks with digital materials and how that's changed. Right, so we are in the active um, fall selling season right now. So in looking at the trends, we are absolutely seeing similar high adoption patterns for the digital products and uh, um, simulation type of products. Um, and, the, and, and really, you know, it's a continuation of what we have seen over the previous years. Uh, you know, even before the pandemic, we, we have seen that shift going on. Um, while the students are moving to digital, but they're not ditching <laughs> the traditional textbook, right? You know, it's really, they're, they're adapting both of them together. But the value of the digital products, in my mind, it, it is here to stay on a permanent basis. I mean, think about it. digital course material is much more than just course material. They have, you know, uh, advanced, uh, you know, analytics and insights capabilities and personalized study plans. Uh, and uh, individual adaptive learning modules, you know, that can uh, cater to specific needs of individual students. So the digital platforms and the digital technologies have come a long way. So they can benefit uh, students tremendously. And, and my feeling is that that's gonna continue forever. And uh, I'm already seeing that, um, you know, especially this spring, uh, those patterns are continuing. We're seeing rapid growth in that area. Curious with Cybooks, Nita, how many people who tried it for the first time have stuck yeah. with it? Um, I'll tell you Cybooks specifically and then kind of widely more broadly. Within Cybooks, we had maybe about, about 30 to 40% of those instructors who hadn't used a Cybook before and used it in the spring of 2020, they started to use it in the fall as well, summer or fall, so summer and fall. And um, our retention generally is upwards of 90%. So um, that trend holds there as well um, <clears throat> for this cohort as well that you know tried it for free, liked it, got value, and then decided to continue. And then across Wiley, in general, across New Wiley Plus and, and Alta, uh, we've done surveys, we've done one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews with instructors and students. And you know, all of that leads us to believe that sort of the, the transition is not transient, but rather it's 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 a permanent transition. So there's and the other thing we're doing is um, now that it's been a year, adding more and more value specifically for this use case. It's online and it's online instruction. So it's for around assessments, around academic integrity, the things that matter a lot to instructors. And so the products are getting stronger. The value proposition is getting even stronger. So we really think that the change is um, <clears throat> the change is here to say specifically for Zybooks, we you know grew 45% year over year, and I would attribute 15 or 20% of that growth to the to the pandemic huge. <laughs> it's a lot yeah. of growth in one year. Yeah. Um, Seisha, I wanted to ask you about academic integrity. And I think you mentioned online proctoring. Um, that has become a huge topic uh, for me as a reporter. I'm doing lots of stories about online proctoring and uh, privacy concerns. And, you know, it's a new thing for a lot of students and some people aren't sure what they think about it. Um, I'm curious how assessment and proctoring changed in the past year and um, what you're doing to improve and support assessment. Absolutely. This is a very important topic, um, Lindsay, as you can imagine. Academic integrity is an area Elsevier takes very seriously, and we are closely partnering with our uh, institutional partners and faculty uh, to help maintain the academic integrity. Now we have successfully introduced remote proctoring across many schools, uh, you know, in terms of taking our secure test exams. Uh, but at the same time, we're also involved in a campaign to educate, you know, faculty and schools in uh, how to optimize the remote proctoring experience. We're kind of doing this jointly with the remote proctoring providers and our in-house psychometrician team. Uh, they have conducted a a number of um, you know webinars. They have released some white papers and recent material. Uh, this is a journey, and uh, you know we are we are clearly um, you know spending a lot of time and energy in that area. 
Uh, on top of the remote proctoring, when we talk about academic integrity, uh, you know, there are also a lot of sites that are catering to kind of enabling cheating type of behavior. Uh, you know, that's that's equally, uh, you know, challenging for faculty. So we are, again, we're, we're trying to partner with the, the institutional partners and faculty anytime we, we come to know of these sites, uh, we're issuing takedown notices. Uh, you know, but it's a, it's a it's a it's a challenge, right? You know, it's uh, it's like we're trying to go after a whole industry, uh, you know, that has been formed in this area. So so there's a lot of work going on in this area. Are you thinking about academic integrity? What does that look like yeah. in terms of assessment? Yeah, like Sasha said, huge topic. A um, lot of instructors, and as they should, view it as their responsibility to grade differentiate and to provide an environment where a student, even in an online environment can, you know, by harder work, by be, be able to demonstrate that he or she knows the concepts better than potentially another student. So I think the great differentiation is important. What we've done is we've really changed a lot within our, our focus and our roadmap to, to add in technology that can help with being able to provide that great differentiation. So as examples, I'll say, um, auto-generating highly randomized, so having highly randomized questions that can be auto-generated, that can ideally be auto-graded as well. Um, within a programming flow, for instance, in computer science, um, if students are writing a piece of code, you can leave behind kind of a signature or, or a trail for the instructor to be able to see, has there been effort put in here, or was this potentially copy pasted from one of the sites that Sasha referred to? Analytics. So being able to show timeline of activity. So we are at doing a lot within, within that realm. And then also um, making um, the viewpoints of those instructors who've done a lot of work in academic in integrity, make, making it available to a wider group by having webinars, by having um, sort of conferences specifically related to academic integrity. But I would say it's both the product and then it's also best practices. How do you administer an exam? Do you give it at the same time? Do you allow it to be given over a longer period of time? And getting those be best practices known to a wider um, instructor group as well. But it's a huge, huge concern and huge area of, of growth for us as well. I think that randomized question approach is really interesting <clears throat> because it's so easy to find uh, the questions and answers you get in the back of a textbook online. <laughs> really, really easy. And it's difficult to combat that as an instructor. Um, Kent, how are you approaching academic integrity? I think you mentioned online proctoring as well. Yes, well, um, you know, as, as uh, folks on this uh, Zoom meeting know, academic integrity has been a big issue for the instructor community for many years. And in fact, you know, leading up prior to the pandemic, uh, as we would hold customer focus groups, uh, uh, there was significant demand on their part for new tools and techniques to address academic integrity as just naturally more and more of their instruction was being delivered at a distance. Um, and so um, kind of our go to market approach is to provide instructors as many options as possible. And as Smitta mentioned in the way our assessment questions are designed uh, through with algorithms to generate variables, uh, to question pooling, um, there, there's a whole range of those things that are out there. And then at one end of the spectrum, you have remote proctoring and we do offer a, a remote proctoring option again, because there is significant demand out there. Um, this is a topic that I hope organizations like BISG will continue to talk about because they're, you know, it's um, very difficult sometimes in the, the way these issues are being handled in the press to get a full understanding of the issues. What I think about from the instructor population, the practicality that they need to address academic integrity issues. Um, they have a lot of constraints in terms of time of what they're able to do. They have uh, uh, constraints on their platforms. Um, and I just don't think there has been enough uh, uh, said and written in discussion about the real need that instructors are facing in this regard because in this, in during this pandemic, we hear it time and time again that this is becoming their number one issue. Absolutely, yeah, it comes up 
a lot <laughs> for us. And I think it's easy to criticize instructors and say that they're being maybe lazy in the questions they're asking, but they're under enormous pressure. So I understand, you know, why that happens. And, you know, you can't make assessment unique to every student easily without a lot of effort. Um, I wanted to switch to a kind of future focus before we get to the Q&A section. If you haven't posted a question yet, please do. Um, but I'd like to ask everyone about uh, what features of digital courseware or learning management systems do you think have the most potential to improve student outcomes? What are you most excited about? What do you think could have the biggest impact? Um, and I wanted to start with Smita, please. Um, <clears throat> you know, our point of view and just through experience in computer science is when you provide a student a really high quality a beautiful user experience, beautiful UI, integrated learning and assessment is that it kind of it kind of changes the game. So it's a digitally native solution. It's been built not for paper. It's been built specifically for the web. And the, the comprehensive and integrated is kind of important. So the student is not sort of ch changing context. They're doing their learning. They're doing their assessments. But it's behind the scene. There's a lot of power. There's a lot of power in, in how it's customized. There's a lot of data analytics that the instructor is given. There's a lot of uh, automation of mundane work, such as grading, that the tool is doing. So <clears throat> we've seen success of, for that in computer science. It's not easy to do. It takes years to build out. And so I think it's really important to do it topic specific. What that you know beautiful solution is going to be for physics will be different for psychology, will be different for economics and finance and and you know chemistry and so on so that's where i see courseware going because or we see courseware going because i think that's a that is a successful model so that's one and i would just say that um one of the problems that i think we all grapple with is how do you help a student when the student is stuck be it at <clears throat> 10 p.m they're stuck they've tried this question several times how do you get that student unstuck so using ai in smart ways to be able to provide that assistant like that. You know, we've been often talking about a digital TA, digital assistant, but really that coming to, to life and it being being realistic and being embedded within this environment that I, that I spoke of, right? That I think that's where I, we see it going and kind of that excites me. And how about you? What, what developments do you think have the most potential? Yeah, I, I would agree that, you know, you think about the flexibility that digital courseware offers. I mean, we know across across the spectrum of students, uh, students learn differently. There, there are, I, I noticed in the Q&A, there was a question in there about someone that said that studies have shown that, that <laughs> students reading, you know, just reading is the best way to comprehend. I would say our feeling is for some students that, that works. Uh, there are other students that don't work that way. Yeah. And I think what these new materials that the courseware that we're bringing out right now supports a variety mm -hmm. of different learning styles. And I think the other thing that Smith mentioned is very important is the timing of when the student is actually learning. Um, what I think these new digital tools uh, are, are great from a flexibility standpoint and with the adaptivity is whenever the student finds that time to be able to focus, these tools are set to optimize that time. And so if you think about the modern student today, many of whom are working, many who, who, who have families, these tools bring greater time efficiency to their focus. And I think that's what is really going to, in the near term, uh, continue to boost the, the, the power of these systems. Tisha, what do you think? What are you excited about? Yeah, some of the common themes uh, from what uh, Smita and uh, Kent have said, uh, the courseware platforms have come a long way. Uh, and um, I had the privilege to work in both McGraw-Hill Connect and uh, Wiley Plus, and now uh, our Elsevier courseware product, um, SharePath, uh, they offer uh, you know, a lot of capabilities for the student. Um, I would say the three things that make the courseware platforms um, you know, very effective in terms of improving student success and student learning, uh, they are the analytics capabilities, you know, faculty to be able to see uh, you know, where my students are struggling, which of the learning uh, objectives and topics where I need to hone in and provide some additional, uh, you know, cover those uh, materials in the class. 
uh, having those insights that uh, they will help tremendously both to the faculty and as well as students themselves. Uh, and personalization capabilities are very critical, right? You know, it, it's not like a cookie cutter approach where you just, uh, you know, build one set of content and give it to everybody. It doesn't work that way. So you need to be able to do personalization within your uh, courseware platforms. Uh, and, and the last thing is use innovative content objects, right? It's, uh, it's uh, in some cases, you know, long form narrative reading works well. In some cases, the bite-sized content works very well. In some cases, the video simulations uh, and media objects very well. So finding the right mix of, uh, you know, how do you, um, you know, kind of package your content into these uh, different formats. I think it's a combination of all of that, but the courseware platforms uh, that are serving the higher ed market, there is a lot of innovation going on in this space. Uh, and uh, we're, we're strengthening it every single day within Elsevier. <laughs> I think that personalization is something I hear about a lot and, and something that is really different to my experience. <laughs> I graduated in 2012, so things have moved on a lot since then. Um, Brian, do we have any questions from the audience that you'd like to ask? We actually have several questions, so we may not get to all of them. And uh, if uh, let's see how we do. So uh, Carrie was asking, um, is our and I want you to be careful about this because we are in a trade association environment. But uh, are you? Is anyone reforecasting to see a down year in print uh, in twenty twenty one? I can tell you from Elsevier point of view, we're not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I say from from my perspective, we're not um, that we don't we don't forecast at that level. But like Sasha, there are still people out there that prefer print. Students prefer print, and we are committed to continuing to provide that option. So um, I, I wouldn't see any any you know dramatic change from what what we've seen in the past. Great, and yeah. go ahead, Smith. No, I was going to say from Wiley's perspective, as I mentioned, the business is pretty diverse across higher ed and um, trade, as an example, and of course, the research side as well. So I think uh, there is, you know, definitely various scenario planning that's going on within Wiley, but I think nothing that's either publicly provided or that um, is certain enough that I could I could state at this point. Thank you. So Lindsay, there's a, a related question Matt was asking and, and Kent, you started to answer part of it with uh, talking about the, the science that says that uh, in, at least in some cases there's better comprehension with print. Um, and I, I think it, Matt's question was, uh, are you getting any feedback from the uh, educational community uh, that have moved to online text and courseware in terms of how students are doing with respect to comprehension and performance? So. Yeah, I can I can take that the the comprehension or the increase there is there is data that showing um, sort of pre pandemic and now and the and the reason why faculty you know decided to move from the free free to using it in the fall is because there is greater comprehension that's that is because of the type of medium it's a learn by doing environment often what courseware providers are learned by doing. There may be simulators, there may be coding environments, there may be animations, and all of that is what contributes. So it's not, not you know, the print format, if you were just taking print and moving it on digital, no. Is it better? No. Um, <clears throat> but the fact that you now have an ability to, to provide, to explain that concept in different ways that can reach certain students and make it accessible for certain students where in the past it was not, right? That's what increases comprehension. And yes, there's lots of data, lots of research, peer-reviewed research papers that have been published that show that. Yeah, and, and as Smita has said earlier, it's really the integration that, that digital courseware uh, allows is that as in the variety of different ways that, that students can be presented with content, either via, via uh, text, via animation, via audio, that ability to provide assessment uh, right away. Uh, we know now from learning science, that's part of the learning process. And that's why, you know, to me, these courseware uh, products that are out there, these enhanced ebook experiences, the fact that they allow both of those things to come together creates to me a very, really very rich learning environment that can be, you know, you add in that ability for the system to kind of get to know 
what the student knows and doesn't knows to make them very powerful? I would, I would say, you know, what we have seen is uh, there is significant value still there in the long form reading and the narrative reading. While as a student, you have option to multimedia objects, simulations, animations, and all of that. But it is not about replacing, you know, long form reading and the value of the traditional textbook. That's what we are seeing. Uh, you know, students are much more savvy in terms of uh, using a combination of both, you know, long form reading and as well as going to their courseware to consume a bite-sized content object. It, it is really that combination that is um, very effective um, in the learning process. That's what we're finding in our research also. Maybe switch gears a little bit, Lindsay. Uh, uh, Rachel is asking a question with respect to um, campuses that have closed and students no longer have access to the disability services offices um, that they had before. And she's just wondering if uh, any of the publishers represented here have made changes to how they address the needs of students with disabilities. And um, to the extent that they can, you know, as, as, uh, have you got long term plans to be better at that? Uh, going forward. So Brian, I can I can um, uh, add some comments on that topic. We are looking into the whole aspect of, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access as one of, you know, the topmost priorities to reflect in our content, especially with more and more content going digital. You know, um, from an access point of view, how do we make sure uh, that uh, we are taking into account this content uh, is uh, uh, available for consumption by all users, uh, you know, especially from an accessibility point of view. I would say it's a, there's a long way to go in this. And, uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, I, I can speak from Wiley and McGraw Hill point of view being there, having been involved in their accessibility initiatives. I think everybody is uh, trying to make improvements, but um, uh, I can say, we still have a long way to go in this area. <laughs> yeah, WCAG uh, being conformant to uh, WCAG guidelines is a top priority, always you know, has been pre-pandemic, is certainly now as well. Um, it's not easy when you're trying to develop interactive tools, as Sesha was saying, to be able to have an equivalent experience. Um, but that's what our engineers strive for. That's what we strive for. And um, again, you know, I, I, I don't know if we have accelerated that in our roadmap. There are other things we've accelerated like automated assessment exam system around academic integrity, right? We shifted the roadmap to focus on those, but WCAG is always there. It takes a portion of our roadmap and it always has and continues to. It's, it's an important area for us. Yeah, uh, to me, it has become a market factor now. Yeah. So, so it's it's not whether we want to be committed to it. To be competitive, you have to you have to have that compliance. And increasingly, uh, institutions are just saying this is the the price of entry. You have to meet accessibility guidelines to have your materials considered on campus. So, so is as my two colleagues have mentioned, that's there. But also on top of that, not only do you have accessibility requirements now, now you have increased scrutiny on the security, data security of your platforms. Um, you have, uh, there's greater uh, pressure to conform to industry standards regarding LMS integrations, um, platform stability. So as we move into a more digital world, these are the, uh, the, the kind of the new challenges that we have to face that in a, in a print world, why there were things like accessibility concerns as it moves digital now, just there's a whole range of new challenges that we face. And Lindsay, uh, there's a, you've, you asked uh, a number of questions that kind of get at elements of this, but Chris was asking uh, as a follow-up question, how have the product roadmaps changed as a result of what was learned during COVID? I mean, that was kind of a core part of what you were asking, but uh, maybe an opportunity for, uh, the, the folks on the panel to just weigh in if they have a perspective on it. On our side, it were the, the aspects I mentioned. We've uh, reached out to instructors, figured out what they, they um, you know, what, what are the top pain points, which are different now than they were pre-pandemic. 
And uh, so um, we're building out as an example, an exam system that we were not thinking of doing earlier that's specifically for computer science and for programming. Um, <clears throat> and building out more of those, we call them golden challenge activities, highly randomized question sets, uh, academic integrity, more similarity checking, things like that. And another aspect that we are doing is also the, the um, and this was pre-pandemic, but we are doing more of that is trying to incorporate elements of a growth mindset within our products that are adaptive. So within Alta, when a student has been struggling and they finally get the answer, being able to let the instructor know that there's sort of an element of resilience here, you know, having confetti come down on the screen or whatever it might be to, uh, to try to encourage the student and try to promote this concept of, of growth mindset as well. So definitely our roadmaps did change as a result of the pandemic. Everybody, love, everybody loves confetti. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say just to add to Smita, there is absolutely a change in our product um, strategies and product roadmap. The one component that we're looking at much more uh, seriously embedding into our product roadmaps is uh, uh, clinical simulations uh, and um, uh, you know expanded clinical judgment capabilities. Uh, I mean, think about it. We are in the field of preparing future health professionals, right? so the frontline workers, you know, the nurses and the doctors, who you need more of uh, in a situation like this. Uh, but when the campuses are closed uh, and when they are not able to access the labs. Uh, you know, how do you uh, provide an environment for, uh, you know, a deeper learning of the clinical judgment and clinical sim simulations and clinical practice? So there is a lot more of that in our product roadmaps nowadays. The big, you know, the biggest change I've seen in our roadmap is actually in our implementation roadmap. Um, we've learned through this process that in many cases, the technology is still beyond what an instructor's capabilities are to use them. And so um, one of the outcomes of the pandemic is we've entered into a partnership with the Online Learning Consortium, whereby we are sending a number of our, our team members, uh, putting them through a special course on uh, quality in online learning, because we have realized now that it's not enough for us just to provide the technology and give a basic overview of how it's used, and then expect that, that uh, instructors and institutions will just figure it out. Uh, we realize now we have to be able to go farther and offer, uh, you know, there's the, the 1.0 level, but you've got to offer 2.0 3.0. And so we rely heavily on a group of digital faculty consultants that we have once we have a customer up to a certain point to then bring them in and have them be able to talk from a teacher's perspective about how to get the most out of our systems. And I think that's where over the, the near term, whether where we can make the greatest uh, uh, growth strides is just getting individuals that are already using digital courseware to use it to a fuller extent. Lindsay, uh, we have several other questions that I'd love to be able to get to, but we're short on time. Uh, they were on things that include open education resources, open access, uh, and uh, the compensation model for content from multiple sources. Uh, but I know that you have at least one going out question, so I'd rather re reserve the time for that and, and thank everybody for their uh, participation today and for your answering so many different questions. Yeah, sorry we run out of time for those questions, but uh, we'll try and keep pretty much to 2 p.m. Uh, thank you everyone for participating in this conversation. I learned a lot. Um, it sounds like it was a challenging year, but one that's really been um, quite pivotal and will change the direction of your businesses and your work for some time to come. Um, as a closing thought, I would love everyone to share their predictions for what they think e-learning might look like in 10 years time, in 2031, um, what will students be doing? Um, Seisha, you mentioned simulations and that kind of clinical practice. Is everyone gonna be wearing you know, headsets? Is that the future? <laughs> Uh, definitely, I think there is a uh, lot more of the uh, artificial intelligence and uh, augmented reality and virtual reality components. Uh, but the one point I would make, uh, Lindsay, is that uh, Elsevier, you know, was founded 140 years back, and the first Mosby book in nursing was published 117 years back. So there is definitely 
uh, a significant uh, value in the trusted component piece, trusted content, irrespective of how fancy the technology is, you need to have that content integrity and the trusted content. And we're always going to be about that within Elsevier is how do we put that trusted content through our advanced platforms and then help faculty and students. That's going to be our focus in 2031 and even in 2041. <laughs> And what do you think it's going to look like in uh, 2031? Well, it's a great question because I was thinking about how the current systems looked 10 years ago when I was preparing for this question. I think it's going to be more personal. I think that the ability for these systems to learn the learner and, and meet them where they're at will continue to, to grow there. Uh, I think it's going to be more visual. I think it's going to be more interactive. Uh, but also, and this is important to this particular group, I think standards are going to be very important. And I think the tools of the future, the adherence with industry standards is going to be important. And then finally, as Seisha said, uh, quality is still going to be king, um, is that you can have the best technology in the world, but if the quality behind the content behind it is not well curated and quality, it's not going to be effective. Your predictions? Um, yeah, I think you know everything that Kent and Sasha said. Um, high quality, interactive, when the student is stuck, help them out. So powerful ways of being able to do that. Subject specific, topic specific, um, all of that. But really, what I'm hoping would be hoping is in the goal of being able to make education more accessible. So affordability is key, and so being able to do everything we're talking about, but in really affordable ways. So you can get the price points done. So make it more accessible. And I think also make it more career relevant. If you make it bite-sized and be able to do it a little bit more career relevant. So at the end, the students who graduate, they can get jobs more easily, right? So e-learning kind of aids us in those two goals. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate all your time. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure to host us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you.